Welcome, everybody. Glad to have you here. Um, this is the second uh, COE research colloquium of the semester. We've got a good crowd. This is great. There are some snacks and things. If you want to grab something uh, during the presentation, feel free. We're going to have two talks. Our, if you haven't been to these before, our format is we uh, each presenter takes about half an hour. And uh, our first presenter today is Alice Amar Bhagavan, you all know, is the head of the Department of Educational Studies and from the Educational Psychology Program. And then Alberto Rodriguez, who just joined us this year uh, in curriculum and instruction, will be going next. So each presenter will talk for about a half an hour. We'll have a transition. Uh, We'll probably have time for a couple of questions during the transition as we change computers and get that sort of thing set up. But then uh, the, roughly the last half hour is available for questions for both presenters and a chance for us to have uh, ongoing discussion. Okay? So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Alma. Thank you, Tim. Well, I'd like to start by saying that this is not going to be a traditional research narrative because, in, fa in fact, uh, we're embarking on a program of research that has turned out to be much more methodologically challenging than I had first anticipated. And so I am actually going to be talking about some of the theoretical and methodological challenges that we're trying to deal with as we move into this, this program of research. And I also want to start by acknowledging my former graduate student, doctoral student, Meng Fan Tsai, who is now at Chunyan uh, Christian University in Taiwan. And she dragged me initially quite reluctantly, I will admit, <laughs> into the study of cognitive engagement because I always said, well, I study learning. I don't do engagement and motivation. But she persuaded me that there were interesting things to look at there. And I'm very glad that she did because I continue to be excited about this field. And so even though the data and the analyses that I'm going to sort of be uh, presenting a little bit today are different from what she did in her dissertation work, I would never have been in this area of research were it not for her. So I did want to thank her for that. So to start with, uh, I guess we should talk a little bit about what cognitive engagement is. If you look at the historical roots of the concept, there's sort of two sets of roots. There's the work of uh, Craig and Delving in cognition that makes the distinction between shallow processing, for example, rehearsal strategies to remember, road memorization, and deep processing, which from an information processing perspective includes things like, you know, elaborating on knowledge, trying to link new information to prior knowledge, reorganizing knowledge and memory, those sorts of things. And so the idea is that when you engage in deep processing, you're showing higher orders of cognitive engagement than when you uh, are engaged in shallow processing. Another sort of set of influences there comes from the motivational literature on traits and drives, sort of the idea of need for cognition. Uh, so some people have a high need for seeking out you know, challenging situations, they respond better to situations of failure, and other people avoid failure, they seek low challenge, and the idea of that literature is that this is sort of a stable, a semi-stable internal trait, that individuals vary in degree on, in terms of their fear of failure, their uh, need for challenge, and things like that. Uh, well, there has been a considerable shift over the years in our understandings of cognitive engagement. So today, for example, one of the clearest articulations of what is a contemporary perspective on engagement is uh, the work of Frederick Blumenfeld in Paris in 2004, which was a review article, which essentially argued that we should look at engagement as a multidimensional construct that has different aspects to it. And these aspects include behavioral aspects, what we do when we're engaged, emotional aspects, how we feel our attitudes, uh, our uh, interests, and cognitive, what are the mental processes that, that we engage in. And uh, as they acknowledge, in practice, there's often overlap in, in these aspects, so that it's not always easy to tell them apart. The other point that these authors made is that it is important to understand that engagement is contextual. In other words, it's not a fixed trait of individuals. It varies as the individual interacts with their environment, the social environment, their task environment, uh, their peers. Uh, and, and so it's really important to uh, look at and, and understand engagement contextually. Uh, uh, 
it varies in degree or level. So within an individual and across individuals, there are different degrees of, of engagement. Uh, and it's malleable. In other words, we can influence people's engagement with the kinds of tasks <laughs> we set for them, with how we interact with them, things like that. And that's actually very important in an educational context, right? Uh, we like to worry about those things that we can influence. <laughs> so so uh, that, that's really uh, important for us. Uh, now, even though conceptually, as you see, you know, the field has sort of moved to embrace a, a richer notion of engagement, there are still problems with the current ways in which people have been measuring cognitive engagement specifically. Uh, many of the measures used in studies continue to be self-report scales, like or type scales. So you see an item like, uh, I would prefer complex to simple questions. I strongly agree or strongly disagree or somewhere in the middle. Or I would rather do something that requires little thought than something that is sure to challenge my thinking abilities. When I study, I take note of the material I have or have not mastered. Okay. Uh, so notice, first of all, these are very global statements, <laughs> right? Uh, they seem to apply that you, you have a certain tendency and that it doesn't matter what the context is, what the discipline is, who you're working with, and things like that, that you can sort of answer these, uh, these things decontextually. The other thing that I draw attention to is that it requires uh, some insight into your own thinking, your ability to look in and report upon your own thinking, in other words, metacognitive knowledge. Uh, another approach to the measurement of cognitive engagement has been to uh, rate observations of instructional discourse. So you look at what happens in a classroom. So this is a little more contextual. It's also a little richer because it looks at real interactions that are happening in classrooms. But the ratings themselves still seem to be very global. So they look at instructional discourse and they rate them in categories like substantive engagement, focused on the content of schooling, like you know, you're asking good questions, higher order questions, the students are responding with explanations and things like that. Or procedural engagement, focusing on getting the task done. You know, how much time do I have? Do I have to answer all the questions? That sort of thing. And, and, and also, since this is actually focused on instructional discourse, it's looking at teacher instructions, how, how the teacher sets the setting for the task rather than the student. And then we do have a few qualitative studies of, of classroom interactions as evidence of engagement. So for example, if you look at the work of Oki Lee and her associates and, and, and Chin and Brown, and uh, this starts to get a little richer in its description. So the work of uh, Lee et al, for example, uh, looks at uh, how the use of uh, things like analogies produced by students during learning, elaboration strategies where they elaborate their knowledge, how those sorts of things uh, influence uh, their, their learning. A lot of it is actually descriptive studies. But still, even uh, with uh, the more qualitative work, one thing I will draw your attention to is that the descriptions are still fairly global and domain general. Uh, So what are some of the issues that exist with the current measure? Some of these issues have actually been discussed in the literature, including the Fredericks and Blumenfeld Paris work that I mentioned. And some of, the, some of these are things that we are focusing on in our program of research. So the first issue that has actually been uh, uh, noted by several researchers is that the scale measures often rely on self-report, as I noted. Uh, and they also focus on uh, being able to articulate metacognitive knowledge and strategies. Uh, well, what does that mean? That means these measures are completely unsuitable for young children. <laughs> and as I said, my central concern is figuring out how young children are engaged in science learning. In fact, if you use these measures, you would have to argue that young children are incapable of engaging deeply in science learning because they don't have metacognition yet, right? <laughs> By all formal definitions of metacognition. So uh, either we are forced into the odd position of saying that young children learn by some other non-engaged mechanism, or we have to redefine our ideas of what it means to, to engage in science learning when you're very little, four and five and six years old. Uh, 
The other issue, which is one that we really want to address in our research, is a lot of the categories like, you know, asking high level versus factual questions, calling for elaborations of knowledge, I think they're useful categories, but they're very global and domain general. And they may fail to capture those sort of contextual types of engagement that are discipline specific. So for example, consider the differences between a sort of uh, brainstorming activity and an activity where you're actually evaluating evidence or trying to generate mathematical proof, right? The patterns of thought are going to be quite different and unique. And, and probably related to different sorts of learning outcomes. And so if you really want to look at how engagement, patterns of engagement are, are related to learning outcomes, I think it might be useful to take a more uh, context-specific and discipline-specific lens in describing engagement. So, we started uh, to try and address these issues actually in the context of a project that I have worked on. Uh, it was funded for four years, but we continue to, to work on the data set with my colleagues, Yuli Matsikopoulos and Helen Patrick. Uh, it's the Scientific Literacy Project. And that project was about uh, uh, working with uh, public kindergarten teachers to introduce an inquiry-based science curriculum, largely life science, uh, that focused on big ideas in the life sciences, and uh, to uh, examine how and what children learn from that kind of an inquiry curriculum. As I said, when we started out, I was uninterested in cognitive <laughs> engagement, and so we never built in any research questions about those sorts of things into that particular grant. But we have thousands of hours of videotape. <laughs> From a single year, we have, for example, over 140 minute videotape lessons. And we have this for multiple years. And uh, I quickly realized that we actually have a very rich source, actually my fun persuaded me that we have a very rich source of data to look at, at students' cognitive engagement. And so that's what you know, got me going on this enterprise. So, we are doing a secondary data analysis, and that has some limitations because, you know, if I were to go back and redesign a study to look at engagement specifically, I might have built in certain kinds of data collection which I'm now unable to, to do retrospectively. But I guess that's the nature of research. <laughs> uh, so the data sources we are looking at are videotapes of classroom inquiry lessons and also the transcriptions of those videotapes. Uh, and, and we actually literally use both. So when we do our analysis, we first view the videotape, we then go to the transcription and start coding the transcription, but oftentimes we will go back and double check the actual live video as we're looking at the, at the transcription. Uh, just to give you an idea of the kinds of schools in which the study was implemented, so who are data source, who the children are who, who are providing us this data, uh, we work in high poverty schools. 71% of the students have, uh, are on free and reduced lunch. Uh, they have a fairly sizable population of underrepresented minorities, mostly Latino and African American children. So about 40% of the students come from uh, minority groups. And uh, just to give you an idea of the kinds of units, I mean, it's beyond the scope of this talk to go in detail into the curriculum, but, you know, we start out with an introduction to the nature of science, where children are introduced to the idea of exploring the world with very simple experiments. The goal of that initial unit is not to teach them about the content of, say, dissolving, it's really to get them to understand how they might investigate something in the world. And then we go into uh, uh, sets of units that really integrate content and inquiry. For example, they learn about ecosystems by using a marine aquarium as a model habitat. They can contrast that system with other possible systems. They learn something about the difference between a model and that which is modeled. <laughs> and so those are all the sorts of things that, that we're trying to teach them. Oh. So in terms of the research questions, well, as you see, we had two sets of complementary questions because you can't understand what kids do without understanding what teachers do and the interaction 
but in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on the first part, which is what is the nature of kindergarten students' cognitive engagement during the course of inquiry-based science learning? So that's the big question we're trying to address. And so, you know, generally what we do is we use an approach that we call quantitative content analysis, but it's, I want to clarify, it's not the sort of thing where you key in words and do word searches and see how often they occur. Actually, the first pass on the data is uh, processing following G et al. is very qualitative. We read the data, we use our theoretical knowledge to derive categories, but we also use a bootstrapping procedure in which we let the data tell us what new categories emerge. So it's sort of a you know, top-down as well as bottom-up uh, process. Uh, we parse all discourse that is transcribed into what we call turn constructional units, or TCUs, which, are, which we define as a semantically complete unit of information produced by a single participant. For example, a complete explanatory statement in a particular context. Or it could be a complete descriptive statement, or it could be something like today's my birthday. <laughs> Uh, we have a two-tier coding scheme. Uh, we have initial categories where we're just trying to preserve sort of the, the basic meaning, the semantics of what, what the child said. And then we have an overarching set of categories where we group these initial categories into things we call inquiry-focused engagement, emotional motivational expressions, things like that's cool, or ew, you know, that sort of thing, <laughs> uh, and routine which is, you know, oh, I forgot my pencil or my science notebook or whatever. So just to give you an idea of, you know, what some of those initial categories look like, and I won't go into all of them in detail because I, I, I don't want to go over time, but uh, one of the things that the students do is they uh, articulate causal mechanisms or processes. Now remember, we're talking about five-year-olds, so the mechanisms they're articulating are quite elliptical. <laughs> they're, not, they're not complete. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, an example is he, that is the caterpillar, can't jump because he doesn't have big legs. <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, they engage in categorical reasoning. Uh, they make inferences about uh, categorical membership, you know, whether some, something is or is not part of a category based on their properties. So why does a butterfly have six legs? Because it is an insect. And this is actually from a, uh, the tomatoes bit is from a unit where they're trying to figure out what's something that the teacher brought in. It's actually a tulip bulb. Is, and so kids are arguing it's an onion, it's a potato, it's a tomato. One kid says, I think the kid meant to say it's a, it's a potato, but said it was a tomato. And the counter argument is it's not a tomato because tomatoes are red. Right? So that's an example of categorical reasoning. They provide functional explanations. For example, a butterfly uses its wings to fly. Uh, they also engage in cognitive sort of epistemic categories of, uh, of uh, thinking and reasoning. So what could we do to find out what the tulip bulb is? We could try to guess. We could plant it in the ground and let it grow. Okay, so that's pretty impressive, I think, for, for five-year-olds. Uh, and then, of course, there are things that you know, that go sort of in the routine category that I talked about, you know, I don't have my science notebook, that's cool, or something completely other, like it's my birthday. Just to give you a sense of, you know, what the raw data looks like from which we, these codes emerge, okay, uh, here's an example from the very first lesson on the first day of the program, about three weeks into the start of school. <laughs> okay, and this is, you know, the water science unit, and the kids are working with things like salt and beans and lemonade powder, seeing what dissolves and what doesn't. And so the teacher says, what do you think it means to dissolve? Remember the lemonade? We got the lemonade. And then Ethan points and says it dissolved. And Matthew elaborates, it dissolved to a different color. So, you know, uh, when you put the powder in, the, the liquid turned orange and so uh, that's what the child is referring to. So we quote that as an observation or a description. These are things that, you know, uh, where the child says it's non-science task focused discourse. The teacher says, can you look at this, take a good look and tell me what you see? And the child says, well, I can't really see this, right? Or someone says, no, you're looking too long. <laughs> uh, and then here is an example of uh, what we quote as a causal explanation. So there, uh, 
making predictions, and the kids all say they, they tend to agree that the salt dissolves, but there's disagreement about whether or not the, the, the beans are dissolving, right? Uh, and uh, so John says the beans will dissolve. They will dissolve. They've been sitting in the water for a bit, so you have to understand the context, right? And, and so the teacher's assistant says, uh, you think so still? And John says, yeah, it, that is the beans, it just has to get wet properly. So he's, he's explaining that if you just let it sit in the water long enough, right, then the beans will, then the beans will dissolve. <laughs> Okay, and so this is another interesting one. So they're, they're still at the beans, okay? The beans are not dissolving, and, and uh, some of the kids are still asserting that it will dissolve. And uh, so the teacher's assistant is saying, you think, they, you think they might? I don't know. The salt didn't take that long to dissolve, though, did it? So they're reminding the kids that the salt dissolved really quickly. And Leticia is sort of agreeing with the teacher's aide, saying, yeah. And then Alexa says, well, just keep stirring. See if that will make it dissolve. So, right? so she's saying, well, maybe we need to do something to the beans to make them dissolve. So she's proposing an extra sort of strategy for like an empirical process that they can then to see if the, if the beans will dissolve. And here's an example of a functional explanation. They're talking about creatures that can and cannot live in the water, why, why human beings can't live in the water and fish can, and Danny says fish, uh, sea creatures breathe in the water because they have gills, right? So that's a, that's a functional explanation. Okay, now I just wanted to contrast this just so that you, you understand that, you know, we're not just making up these <laughs> categories for SLP. Here's what discourse uh, from a non-SLP science classroom looks like, where we did not work with the teachers to help them teach through inquiry. They're also engaged in what you might call a hands-on inquiry activity. They have a series of plastic eggs. Each egg has a different thing in it. And the goal of the lesson is to get the children to understand that they can use their senses to figure out what's in the egg. Okay. But if you look at the level, and I didn't call this, but if you look at the level of discourse, it's all about what do you think it is? <coughs> the child says, I think it's a penny. So the teacher, instead of asking the child, why do you think it's a penny, says, oh, it sounds like pennies. So the teacher is providing the, the inference or the explanation to support what the child says. Uh, and then, uh, which one is this? And the student says, dice. The teacher says, okay, now grab another one. So we figured out that there's a penny and there's dice. Now let's, they're just going through the eggs, sort of. The, it's very task focused. We've got to go through all the eggs and figure out what's in there. So when Bert says dice, teacher says, okay, grab another one. No conversation about why do you think it's, it's dice or anything else in there. Uh, then to Ali, what do you have left? What haven't you used yet? You already did M&Ms. You haven't done it, it's a reason for us, okay? So there really is a difference in the nature of engagement, and this is, I mean, in the interest of time, I picked a small excerpt, but it's 40 minutes of this, essentially. Oh. Uh, so, so, oops. So, now, does engagement matter? At first blush, you know, we have some results that seem to support it. So for example, in the first year, we did a regression analysis. Uh, we computed something called an inquiry index. So you know, all those categories of engagement that we call inquiry categories, we com computed the total for each child. And uh, then we ran a regression to see whether, you know, the total number of inquiry engagement uh, utterances per child uh, actually uh, uh, predicted what uh, they learned in terms of our, uh, you know, science learning assessment, which we gave at the end of the year. And it turned out that, in fact, there was, it was a significant predictor. So we can actually, we have some indication that how children engage in the classroom actually relates to what they learn at the, at the end of the year. Uh, in, uh, in year three, we're just analyzing the results, so it's, it's incomplete. We have only analyzed eight out of 20 weeks uh, so far, and in only three of the 12 SMP classrooms. And if you see what we're doing, you, you can imagine that it's very time consuming uh, to do this. So I don't have any 
regression results to present yet because we only have partial data. But uh, we do have some remarkable statistics. So the uh, uh, mean number of inquiry turn construction units per child uh, over this uh, eight week period, some nine lessons, is 51 uh, inquiry units per child. The average reported in the literature is less than two <laughs> uh, in these sorts of studies. So really, very young children are engaging cognitively in a lot of inquiry-based uh, utterances. We also wanted to see whether uh, engaging in these kinds of in inquiry utterances was simply a byproduct of something else, like maybe they were just verbally competent. And so we have uh, the Woodcock-Johnson measures of passage comprehension at the beginning of the year, and we also have the Woodcock-Johnson measures of science knowledge. And neither of those have any significant correlation <laughs> with how children are engaging in the classroom. Okay, which is a good thing, that's what we want to see. We don't just want to see that the ones who come in knowing a lot are the ones that are dominating the conversation. Now, having said that, we do have some thorny issues to grapple with. <laughs> uh, one is, what should the unit of analysis be? Uh, in some of what I presented you, the unit of analysis is the individual child. But you can actually cut this data a lot of different ways, and sometimes it gives you different answers. One can look at a small group or a whole class discussion as a unit of analysis. One can look across topics or lessons. Uh, one can look in terms of the inquiry cycle. You know, uh, does, to our surprise, one of the things we're finding is a lot of the inquiry-based TCUs have, well, a lot of them happen at the end, you know, in the wrap-up, which I would expect but a lot of them also happen in the beginning in the brainstorming session. In the middle, there seems to be less because the children seem to be more behaviorally engaged. They're actually doing the business of measuring and recording and things like that. So they don't articulate as much in terms of doing inquiry units. So that's one of the things that, that we want to be looking at. Uh, another thing uh, that I worry about is whether the TCUs that I talked about, you know, each individual semantically complete unit that one person makes is the right unit of analysis. Uh, so if you uh, notice those excerpts that I showed you from the raw data, uh, one of the things I realized is that it's actually, I don't know if you share my sense, but to me it's more informative when you see those segments all together rather than that first set of categorizations that I showed you where I gave you the definition and the categorization, it seems to me that the interaction unit that is broader than the individual child is a more meaningful unit. But then, well, how big should that interaction <laughs> you know, be? Where do you parse the, the unit? That's, that's a really tricky problem, not just for us, but I think for, for, for other people that, that work in the field. Another question that is really hard to answer are sort of issues of what I call the density and dispersion of discourse as evidence of engagement. So uh, in the analyses I presented to you where we calculate sort of the inquiry index by child, you know, the whole number of inquiry units, you can certainly look at things like what the mean is and what the standard deviation is. And it turns out that the standard deviations are huge because some children produce a lot more <laughs> discourse uh, than, than, than others. Uh, uh, so then you have to ask yourself, does the amount of participation uh, matter and does the nature of participation matter? Do some of these subcategories carry more weight than others? Those are things that are, that are really hard to, to explore. I'm also interested in contrastive case studies. If you look at our data, we do have a subset of children who don't say a lot, but show huge gains uh, across the program. Okay. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, this is sort of a general problem uh, with measuring any discourse-based measures of, of, of learning and understanding, right? Uh, we've all been uh, at a colloquium where people were going back and forth asking questions, and we had a really good question, but we didn't ask it because it didn't quite fit the flow of discourse, right? <laughs> so we are engaged, but nobody would know it by looking at us. And so I wonder whether some of what is going on is that even students who don't necessarily 
articulate things in the flow of discourse might be having internal patterns of thought that are richer because they're in a discourse-rich environment where, where there is inquiry-based discourse. And so one of the ideas I have, I don't know if it'll pan out, I may be chasing ghosts here, <laughs> but one of the ideas I have is to actually, so we have attendance data and we know in what group kids were, so do episodic analysis to see uh, whether the kids who are these contrastive cases uh, are actually present in episodes where interesting epistemic or, uh, or inquiry-based discourse happens even though they don't contribute to it, or whether that's irrelevant. Now, I don't know if you'll have sufficient data for this analysis to pan out, but that's one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping to look at. And then another important question is sort of, what is gained or lost when a teacher redirects the flow of an inquiry discourse uh, in order to disperse or increase participation. So often what happens is there's a really interesting conversation going on. And when it's interesting, it often needs a lot of time to play itself out. And the teacher is aware of that. So teachers always have this tension between, do I let this set of kids run with the conversation or do I bring other kids in by redirecting? And so, you know, what are the sort of gains or losses in engagement, in learning that happen when you make those kinds of decisions. And finally, there are huge issues of data loss that people don't really talk about with this kind of research. So for example, in year three alone, we have over 100 videotaped lessons, but uh, close to 5% of those videotapes are unusable because either some or all of them have no audio. <laughs> <laughs> we've lost our <audio. laughs> So you have about 5% data loss off the top. And this is actually from talking to colleagues. It's not much reported. It's not atypical. It happens. Um, then you start coding the video. You start doing transcriptions. And there are kids you, don't, you can't identify. Yes. And there are things you can't hear. <laughs> and so really, there's, there's a large segment of data loss. So I think one of the challenges, if you really want to understand sort of if you're interested in, in global patterns, not just case studies, is how do we figure out whether that data loss is random or whether we're really losing important things? If, is there some way of developing some, so, some sort of check, you know, to see whether that, that, that kind of attrition is, is influencing or biasing our data in some way? I don't know the answers to these questions, but these are some of the methodological and theoretical challenges that we're dealing with today. And with that, I'll stop and <laughs> open up the floor to questions. So we can take a few questions now while, uh, while we transition in Alberta. You can get your computer set up. But we'll have more time at the end. Question follow up the last slide. I think of what are the gains or loss uh, when the teacher redirects the flow of inquiry discourse to disperse part. Engagement. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's to whom, uh, in terms of this group of people who are engaged in, in the conversation, uh, whether they have loss or gain, or to those who are not included in the conversation. So we are talking about uh, the uh, benefit to whom, I mean, gain or loss to who, which, have, which group, subgroups. That, that's part of it. <laughs> so there may be motivational benefits to including those who were not part of a conversation and motivational loss. losses to those. But there may be also cognitive uh, losses when you don't follow through on a thread of, of inquiry. That's also not to be minimized, right? If, if, if children are grappling with how do you, so there's an issue we can't resolve. So it, we had this, this you know, it, actually in our very first year, we had a very inexperienced teacher, first year of teaching kindergarten, and uh, she had this first day of class, had this beautiful, that was the one with the tulip bulb, right? Had this beautiful conversation where she brought it in and she had the kids think about, you know, she had the kids try and figure out what it was and they're arguing it's, a, it's an onion, it's because it's got skin, it's a potato, it's this, that, and it's a nut. And, and they just can't resolve it, right? And she keeps saying, instead of you know, moving on or things, she keeps saying to them, well, how can you figure it out? Tell me how you can figure it out. And some kids say, well, we've got to be thinking. And she said, well, but you have been thinking. And so in, but all the teacher does is provide what we call epistemic press, right? <laughs> and through all of this, this little girl, she's been very quiet throughout the proceedings, hasn't said much. And she says something very softly. And the teacher says, oh, can you say that again? And she says a little louder. She says, well, you can plant it in the ground and let it grow. 
And that's like the big aha moment. The teacher said, everybody listen. Listen to what she said. We can plan. So this, the idea of an empirical test, they're sort of bringing out the idea that we can actually, we can't, we can't figure it out through argument, through what we already know, but we can do an empirical test and try and figure it out. Uh, so, uh, you know, now, maybe the teacher could have said, well, that's enough of that. We can move into something else, and, and they would have lost a really important opportunity. So there's no easy answer. There are trade-offs. Yeah. So I understand this is inquiry approach, and that we know a great deal about students, you know, that's just the mm -hmm. back and forth, back and forth. But I think my question is, is are there points where the students are cognitively engaged and they they initiate or they take charge of this conversation rather than it being teacher directed? In fact, uh, if you notice so the, the, the last segments of that dissolving conversation, right, that's all kid directed, right? So uh, where the kids are saying, well, no, you just got to let it get wet. No, you got to stir it a little longer. In fact, in, in that particular classroom, they let the kids stir it a little longer to see, you know. <laughs> How often does that happen? How often do teachers allow those points for students to to initiate and run with their, their findings or ideas? It varies. Uh, yeah. Professional development is a part of it, working with teachers to, to help. The, so we, we give them, vid once we had some videos, we would have them look at videos of their past teaching and, and reflect upon them. That helps. It varies within teacher. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we all know that as professors, right? Some days <laughs> we do better than others. But yes, I mean, it's not, it's not a fixed characteristic, but it's very important. I